Dear friends, family, and saints of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this is Marlene from Building Zion, and I would like to welcome you today. Um, so before I actually start, I want to, I guess, announce that I have decided, since I have all these papers here, it might, some people might find it nice to go someplace and actually read the paper. So I have created a blog where you can go read the paper. Um, I will put the link to it in the video description, but it is buildingzionlds.blogspot.com. And I don't, um, I haven't actually figured out how to fix it so that you can actually download the paper. I'm going to have to try and figure that one out. But you can just copy and paste. It's just, it's all written in there, so you can just copy, copy it, and then paste it into a word processor of your choice. So, and then, of course, you can do what you want with it. Okay. So getting started, um, my studies the past couple of weeks have led me down the path of coming to understand who the sons and daughters of God are. So like with many things that I talk about in these videos, either I only had a rough understanding of the subject before my study on the topic, or I really didn't know anything at all. This one, I admit, I really didn't know much about the subject. I was reading in Doctrine and Covenants 25 and didn't get past verse Five, uh, verse 1 in my study when the subject opened up to me. That verse reads, DNC 25 1, hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, while I speak unto you and the smith, my daughter. For verily I say unto you, all those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. So I had heard, you know, sons and daughters of God. I know we are sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, um, but I didn't really understand what that meant, sons and daughters of my kingdom. That phrase caught my attention. I had seen it many times before, but suddenly realized that I didn't really understand what it meant, so that led me on a lengthy scripture chase of which I wish to share with you today. It is important to recognize that every one of us are children of God by virtue of being born of God spiritually even those who follow Satan and did not receive a body. But to then become a son and daughter of God is different. It is the process of making oneself holy through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Being reborn through the power of the priesthood, agreeing to make priesthood covenants, and fulfilling them faithfully through ordinances. Understanding who the sons and daughters of God are leads us to understand the qualities of celestial beings. And that right there is why I wish to go over this topic with you. What is our goal in life? What has been our goal since we've lived in the pre-existence with our Heavenly Father? To become celestial beings. Right now we live in a telestial world and are telestial beings. During the millennium, the world will become a terrestrial world and we will be terrestrial beings. But that is not our final destination. It is only a step along the way. Since the days of Adam, God has always given his children celestial laws. Brigham Young explained this of celestial laws. Quote, when we talk of celestial law, which is revealed from heaven, that is the priesthood, we are talking about the principle of salvation, a perfect system of government, of laws and ordinances, by which we can be prepared to pass from one gate to another, and from one sentinel to another, until we go into the presence of our Father and God. Brigham Young, in another talk, also says, quote, A man who has had his mind open to the operation of the priesthood of the sons of God, who understand anything of the government of heaven, must understand the finite, that finite beings are not capable of receiving the celestial law in its fullness. When can you abide celestial law? When you become a celestial being, and never until then. And I see I need to make a little correction in the quote. It should say, a man who has his mind open to the operation of the priesthood 
of the Son of God, referring to Christ. It is important to note here that we are not capable of living the celestial law in its fullness. That does not mean that we don't have parts of the celestial law that we are living now. Heber C. Kimball explained, quote, What is celestial law? A great many of you think that you have not come to it, but the fundamental principles of quote-unquote Mormonism are faith in Jesus Christ, repentance for sins, and baptism for their remission, which is the door into the kingdom of God, are the first letters of the alphabet of celestial law, close quote. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai and received the law, but then came down and found the children of Israel building a golden calf, part of that celestial law was taken away and they were given a smaller portion because that is all they could handle. Today, the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored, which includes all of the keys. But that does not mean that we are being required to live the fullness of celestial law at this time. We have as much as we can handle and more is unfolded, not revealed, but unfolded to us as we become purified and sanctified and willing to live more of that law. It is by going through the process of making oneself holy through the atonement of Jesus Christ, being reborn through the power of the priesthood, agreeing to make covenants at baptism, and in the temple, and fulfilling them faithfully through ordinances that we become the sons and daughters of God who will eventually be able to live the fullness of celestial law. So who are the sons and daughters of God? What are their characteristics and attributes? Who is it that we are striving to become? The list of who they are is quite lengthy. But what else can we expect from celestial beings who are like unto God? I do hope you don't leave as I'm reading through these scriptures. Like I said, it's rather lengthy. But rather, let the scope of all these attributes wash over you. This is where we are headed. This is an amazing promise to God's children that is available to all of us to obtain as God is no respecter of persons. There may be certain promises or blessings given to certain tribes or certain individuals, but the things of the celestial kingdom are promised to all of his children who accept his gospel, make temple covenants, and live faithfully. As President Monson stated, quote, the worth of a soul lies in its capacity to become as God, close quote. So as I go through these, I will not read the scripture reference, but you will be able to see them here, or if you go to the blog, you'll be able to um, read through them. I may comment on a few of them, but mostly I'm going to let the scripture speak for itself. Just a note that in most of the verses, it will just refer to... um, It will, sorry, in most of the verses, it will just refer to the sons and daughters of God as they or as sons of God. There are only a few that use sons and daughters of God. But we know that in most cases, when the masculine is used in the scriptures, it also refers to the feminine. Not 100% of the time, but most of the time. Also, I want to point out here that to become a son and daughter of God means um, having made temple covenants and means having been sealed to an eternal companion. This means that the son and that the son and daughter are now yoked as one. So when referencing one of them, it automatically refers to the other. Just like as it says in 3 Nephi 11.27, Verily I say unto you that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are one, and I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and the Father and I are one. And John 15.7, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. 
So just as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one, they are not the same person, but three distinct persons with distinct roles within the priesthood and Godhead. And as Christ said, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father. So is a man and a woman one, but two distinct persons with distinct roles within the priesthood and sealing. Now, please, on that note, I do want to remind you of one thing here. I am discussing here the righteous union between a man and a woman. There are many unions that have one or the other who are not living up to their temple covenants, and there are many who have been ordained to the priesthood or have been endowed in the temple and are unmarried. I want to remind everyone that the commandment that Heavenly Father has given us is that we must be sealed in the temple and live up to our personal covenants. If we are... <clears throat> Excuse me. If we are married to someone who fails to live up to their covenants or we never have the opportunity to be sealed in the temple, opportunity is key, not just that it wasn't convenient or we couldn't find the absolute perfect person. Then Heavenly Father has promised us that things would be made right later and we would have the opportunity to be sealed later and receive of all the blessings that he has promised to the faithful. Okay, so here we go. Without further ado, who are the sons and daughters of God? Sons of God take wives. So again, I want to remind you, it says sons of God, but it's also referring to daughters of God take husbands. And it is not just a marriage, but the sealing in the temple. Going on, Satan will try to disguise himself among them, but will not be able to. He will seek to destroy them. Oh, one more thing I want to mention here. Some of these scriptures I have not directly quoted, I have paraphrased. So definitely, if you want to see the, the exact quote in the scripture, go back to the reference and read the exact scripture. Okay, continuing. They will shout for joy with all the eternal creations and declare his name forever and ever. They are gods and are children of the Most High. They will answer, they will ask their maker of things concerning them and concerning his work. They are numbered among the children of Israel and shall be gathered together. They receive him and are given power to become sons of God. They believe on his name. They are saved by faith in his name. By faith, they become the sons and daughters of God. Christ spoke these words unto their father, saying, Whatsoever thing ye shall ask the Father in my name, which is good in faith, believing that ye shall receive, behold, it shall be done unto you. They believe on his name and become the sons of God and are one in me, and I am one in the Father, as the Father is one in me, that we may be one. They bear one another's burdens. They receive Christ are given power to do many miracles and to become the sons of God. They believe on his name and are given power to obtain eternal life. They have a correct understanding of the nature of God. They are led by the Spirit of God. They are redeemed from under the law and receive the adoption of sons. They are no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. They are blameless and harmless. They shine as lights in the world amongst a crooked and perverse nation. They endure chastening. They faint not when they are rebuked. They give reverence to the Father. They are beloved. They are like him. They see him as he is. They overcome and inherit all things. They are they who receive the testimony of Jesus and believed on his name and were baptized after the manner of his burial, being buried in the water in his name, and this according to the commandment which he has given, 
that by keeping the commandments they might be washed and cleansed from all their sins and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of him who is ordained and sealed unto this power, and who overcome by faith and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. They are they who are the church of the firstborn. They are they whose hands the Father has given all things. They are they who are priests and kings, who have received of his fullness and of his glory, and are priests of the Most High, after the order of Melchizedek, which was after the order of Enoch, which was after the order of the only begotten of the Son. Wherefore, as it is written, they are gods, even the sons of God. Wherefore, all things are theirs, whether life or death, or things present or things to come. All are theirs, and they are Christ's, and Christ is God's. And they shall become all things. They glory in God. These shall dwell in the presence of God and his Christ for ever and ever. These are they whom he shall bring with him when he shall come in the clouds of heaven to reign on the earth over, the, over his people. These are they who shall have part in the first resurrection. These are they who shall come forth in, in the resurrection of the just. These are they who are come to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly place, the holiest of all. These are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and first and church of Enoch, and of the firstborn. These are they whose names are written in heaven, where God and Christ are the judge of all. These are they who are just men made perfect through Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, who wrought out the perfect atonement through the shedding of his own blood. These are they whose bodies are celestial, whose glory is that of the Son, even the glory of God, the highest of all, whose glory the Son of the firmament is written of as being typical. These are they who are valiant in the testimony of Jesus, wherefore they obtain the crown over the kingdom of our God. They bow before his throne in hum humble reverence and give him glory forever and ever. They who dwell in his presence are the church of the firstborn, and they see as they are seen, and know as they are known, having received of his fullness and of his grace. They are made equal in power and in might and in dominion. They receive the, the gifts of the Spirit, which are the gifts of the Holy Ghost, to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he was crucified for the sins of the world, the gift to believe on their words, that they also might have eternal life if they continue faithful. The gift to know by the Holy Ghost the difference of administration. The gift to know by the Holy Ghost the diversities of operations, whether they be of God. The gift of the word of wisdom. Now, that's not the, the word of wisdom as um, what we should eat, but it is the word of, of being wise, which does include the word of wisdom, but it encompasses more than just that. The gift of the word of knowledge, that all may be taught to be wise and to have knowledge. The gift to have faith to be healed. The gift to have faith to heal. The gift of the working of miracles, the gift to prophecy, the gift of the discerning of spirits, the gift to speak with tongues, the gift of interpretation of tongues. They are in the similitude of his only begotten. They are one in God. They hearken and give heed unto the Lord. They respect their bodies as being in similitude of the Father. They are the peacemakers. They cannot die any more, for they are equal unto the angels. They are children of the resurrection. They are gathered together in one. They have faith in Christ Jesus. They are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. 
They love God and keep his commandments. They open their mouths unto prophecy. They fear not and are his. They are faithful and walk in the paths of virtue. Their lives are preserved and they receive an inheritance in Zion. So could I ever come to receive and become all of that without jointly working with my Heavenly Father, Savior, and my spouse? I would say no, <laughs> not in the least. This is what we have to be actively moving toward becoming to get to be that Zion people. We will achieve it before, will we achieve it before the earth receives its celestial glory? No, but if this is not who we are actively striving to become, then we are not God's. We are not his. We are of Babylon and of the devil. The blessings that our Heavenly Father has for us are innumerable, far more than are contained in this list. I'm sure there are other things that I missed that I, I didn't write in the list. Um, but what he acts of us in comparison is minute, a drop in the bucket compared to the flood of gifts and blessings that he sincerely wants to give us. And I promise you, with everything that is in me, that as you give those drops, which for us as imperfect mortal beings is everything we have, he will give you more than you can imagine. I have, and I continue to see it in my life, I even at times feel like a little kid sitting on my daddy's lap and he is just giving me all the love and spoiling me more than I could ever accept. And if I feel that way from the pitiful offering that I give him, for I know that I daily fall short of anything that is celestial, I know that all of his children can feel the same. Does that mean that soul-crushing trials don't come? Absolutely not. My soul has been crushed on more than one occasion. But I have chosen to be sealed His, and though that does not lessen the trial, it does save my soul from the depths of hell where the enemy of my soul wishes to drag me. Our Father in Heaven knows even the most minute details of our lives and thoughts, and nothing is more important to Him than our salvation and joy. I just saw a tweet from Elder Holland yesterday that said, quote, The scriptures teach us that you and I are God's world. We are His highest priority, His very work, His whole purpose is to bless us. As such, he has not now, nor will he ever forsake, nor forget, nor give up on us. Close quote. Brothers and sisters, let us all strive with all our being to become the sons and daughters of God. Nothing on this earth can compare with the blessings the Heavenly Father has for us. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.